Cody. Thank you, brother. Oh. Hey. Oh. <laughs> so will there be a season two of Buying London? <laughs> Great question. We don't know yet. We'll oh. soon find out. Apparently there is going to be one. I think the world wants it. We were top 10 in 55 different countries. We know that there's a format for it and they like it. I went through a stage in my life where I sold the most expensive home that I've ever sold at the time for over $100 million. And that was the saddest moment of my life because I had no one to share it with. I didn't believe that the business I was working in cared. I didn't get paid a lot for it. There wasn't a moment of enjoyment. And if you can't enjoy something and share it with your colleagues or the people that you love, that was really difficult. That was very sad. Are you a billionaire? Maybe in report. rupees, maybe in rupees. <laughs> maybe in rupees. <laughs> You know, there's apparently a TMZ report that's trying to guess how much you're worth. I've actually got the video somewhere and yeah. it says that I'm worth 172 million. Did you know that? I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea. It's amazing, it's amazing the information you get off the internet nowadays. What's up everyone? Welcome back to another episode of The Real Ones. Today, I'm joined by the one and only Mr. Super Prime, Daniel Daggers. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Love that. Sorry, I meant to say he only sells to the rich and famous and uh, Daniel Daggers, Mr. Bond. Um, <laughs> Are you trying to do my accent? Do you have a Bentley now? Is that No, I don't have a Bentley. <laughs> I had a Bentley in Dubai ah. for about five and a half hours. Okay, okay. <laughs> That's why I had a Bentley. That's why I had a so Bentley. you're apparently, yeah. apparently, some say, some say. Your mom says. My mom says. That you are the best real estate agent in the world. There's probably an element of data out there that might prove that I'm somewhere out there. Except that data is undiscovered. <laughs> we're still looking no, for the data. No, it's data that we're making. <laughs> <laughs> so you're making the data that will confirm this. Okay, yeah. no problems. Um, look, obviously, I'm really grateful that you've taken the time to sit down. I know you're a very busy man. Um, always have been, but more so you. now. As um, are you. I appreciate that. Um, it's good. Busy is good. Um, Busy is so great. We want to hear about your story growing up, right? Like, uh, we want to hear about seven year old Daniel Daggers, right? Seven year old? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, loved my football everywhere I went. I had a little football under yeah. my arm. Yeah. Um, wore an Arsenal kit okay. and was only interested in football, Lego. Um, hated girls and uh, and so a, different now <laughs> yeah. and an only child okay. okay and so I would uh, find every excuse to uh, go and kick the ball around with my dad when he was around which was lovely opposite yeah. we lived in local authority housing and bang opposite there was like grass area so government housing and then there's grass area and I used to go and play football there with my dad which was lovely I went to uh a private school mm -hmm. but it was a new one so we got like a form of cheaper admission okay um, which was great I mean I didn't learn very much but it was great um, I saw how wealthy kids lived to yeah. a certain extent where mum would turn up in a in a convertible gold Mercedes and then when I was nine I went to a local youth center and I saw a totally different side of the world and how people with one parent and probably a lot less than than we had uh, were living Okay, and um, you wanted so you wanted to become a football player, just initially. probably like most boys and girls now. Yeah, in the UK, you forced me to watch my first football game. I did force you. Yeah, yeah I forced that you. was uh, it was an interesting. But you guys won. To be fair, well, we're Arsenal. We we always always <laughs> fair enough. Yeah. Um, what's one of those like? I mean, obviously, it's like you said. You've seen the this like you know the spectrum of very wealthy. Yep. Not so wealthy. Um, and everyone in the middle. Everyone in the middle. Yep. When you're dealing with the kind of clients that you deal with today, do you find that people are actually very different just because of that uh, wealth factor or? Um, it's the level of wealth. When you meet, yeah. actually, I would say people are remarkably similar, yeah. but also very different mm. in some aspects of their lives. Okay. So because of the internet now, we tend to watch the same Programs like Netflix, buying London, great, great show, watch it. <laughs> Just um, sponsored. <laughs> but, but regardless of where you are in the world, as yeah. long as you can get the content, most people are on these platforms. So we're watching the same TV shows, we're listening to the same music, we, you know, we're going on the same holidays because there's more awareness, so we know where to go, and all that sort of stuff. So whilst we're really different people, we're actually quite similar. Mm. The, it only gets really different when someone's a billionaire. Okay. Um, and that's because they 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 tend to have a slightly different way of communicating and thinking. Yeah, 
Are you a billionaire? No. Ah. Uh, there's this TMZ Maybe in report. rupees. Maybe in rupees. <laughs> maybe in rupees. <laughs> you know, there's apparently a TMZ report that's trying to guess how much you're worth and there's, uh, and all of your agents. Oh my God, like I saw it. What do you mean? I saw it. It was... Uh, no. There's a, I've, actually got, I've actually got the video somewhere and no. it says that I'm worth 172 million. Did you know that? <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea. It's amazing, <laughs> it's amazing the information you get off the internet nowadays. It's like, you figured it out. Um, yeah. Okay, so you've gone from seven-year-old wanting to be a football player yep. to becoming one of the biggest real estate players on the planet. Mm. What's that journey like? How did that happen? Because I know that not too long ago, a few decades maybe, you were sitting by the window of a real estate outlet, like a real estate brokerage kind of a thing, and you were making your daily calls. You were trying to win the deals and uh, do all of that fun stuff. Talk to me about that time in your life. Um, I love my journey because mm. because storytelling is so important and I think my journey is amazing. It resonates with practically every real estate agent across the planet because I started right at the bottom selling hundred thousand pound studio apartments and one bedroom apartments and then end up selling a hundred million dollar homes. The interesting thing about my journey is that it is so similar to so many other people and everyone can have my journey. I genuinely believe that mm -hmm. um, and I did it without help from a wealthy family, um, without, without ladders from successful people to enable me, yeah. and, uh, or stardom fame. Um, so we did the Netflix show after I achieved my success, which you need to be brave about, right? Because it's the next phase of my career. But I am fundamentally the rawest form of estate agent you'll ever meet or broker, yeah. because I've lived everyone's journey. And so I've trailblazed, but I've also done everyone else's journey. And I love that about my journey because it means I can resonate with all the agents. Um, I worked at Vickers & Co, which is a small independent office, sat at the window in West London. It's like, you know, same office that you would see anywhere in the world. And I sat there for 10 years. And mm -hmm. the first four years we had no internet. So we had a fax machine, I had a landline number, I had a Rolodex um, or a box full of cards and, um, and, and, a, and some drawers, some black drawers with uh, details of properties in it. Mm. And it was just go out and work. And my first day I walked in, I was a bit, I was a bit nervous because I was 17 and a bit, it was my first job. And there was a very attractive young lady working in the mm -hmm. office and she was there first and I got there early and she let me in and I was a bit nervous. I was 17, couldn't even look at a girl let alone talk to her. Um, That's me today. And <laughs> you're a bit older than 17, maybe. Uh, and and I was a bit spotty, um, and I was I was you know just I didn't know anything about anything. I genuinely didn't didn't study well. Didn't didn't know much. And I remember being sat at the desk, and my boss came over to me because he came in a bit later, and he said, "Okay, pick up the phone, make phone calls." And I thought to myself, "What do you mean? I have to speak to strangers?" So everything becomes a new form for you, right? It's a new form of converse, right? Like conversation. So you're now trying to sell something to somebody. I've never done that before. No. Except for washing cars and stuff like that. I've never sold anything over the phone to anybody. I didn't, I didn't get taught how to show property. Mm -hmm. Everything was new. It was, like, it was like petrified of something new, do it, fail, lose confidence, keep going because there was nothing else you could do, win it once, get better at it, then think you're the dog's what's it, right? And then all of a sudden fail again and then have to improve. And that was the journey with absolutely everything. Wow. Yeah, and for then, 10 years. Right. After four years, the internet came along and we started to realize that we needed a website. Why do we need a website? Well, because Foxons have got a website and someone in Asia might buy a property in London through our website. What are you talking about? And there's me sat in the corner listening to this mm. happen. So when I saw social media came come along and just influence change, I knew that that sounded similar to me. Yeah. Um, so I did that for 10 years and then I moved to a big firm and scaled that big corporate business, which is a different game to small independence. How so? A small independent is like, you know, grind away and there tends to be a ceiling because you can't climb a ladder necessarily. And then it's like a full ceiling that the, that the company has mm. because the company's not massive. So you can only get you know, one scale, two scales up, and then you hit boss level. Right. You're not gonna, you're not gonna out, you're not gonna out the boss. 
So that's the small independent and it's more of a lifestyle play if you get good at it. Yep. Working in a big corporate, you, you have to play two games. You have to play the work game and be amazingly good at it and then political game. Mm. And I hate political games. What? Okay, you're going to have to go more into that. Like you can't no, say like that I think anybody who works in a big organisation with <laughs> yeah. lots of people, politics are involved. You know, your Absolutely. opinion, someone else's opinion, what they like, what they don't like, someone's concerned about their job, you're concerned about your job, you think you're doing something right, you've hurt someone's feelings. There is a strategy and execution, whose strategy is right, who can execute well. You know, all these things sort of just are working in the background whilst you're doing your day job as well. And I couldn't balance the two. Yeah, I feel like it's such a waste of time, to be honest. You could yeah, it is, yeah. Much more. But, but still, in big corporates, that's, that's just how the game works. So you left a big corporate, and then you set up your own shop, and then became the fourth largest uh, in terms of deals done, I believe, right? So if you're going to scri- describe it correctly, because I don't want to be, yeah. uh, I don't want to misdescribe our success, because I don't think that's fair on everyone else. But we are the fourth most influential real estate business at marketing and selling homes over five million pounds across the UK. And I'm very proud of that statement because it's a self-funded business. It was started during COVID at my kitchen table, which obviously I've never done before. And we have some really big incumbents here, massive incumbents with thousands of people, loads of pedigree and history. And we did it in three and a half years. So a lot of people are kind of feeling the same burn that you did in terms of, I don't want to deal with the politics, I want to get shit done, and they want to set up their own shop. And there's a lot of this in Dubai, where we're typically- But you have it already though, because everyone in Dubai is an independent practitioner. Exactly. So, so they're running their own business anyway. Um, here, here it's an estate agency yeah. business, it's very different. Right, right, but yet we have 5,249 brokerages but in Dubai now. Correct, but they're yeah. all independent. Yeah, everyone yeah. who works in it in the in the Dubai world tends to be independent. Not I'm aware of. Yeah, a lot of them still do the fifty fifty kind of splits and things like that. No, there will be yeah. splits, but yeah. they actually they, they run their own business on the platform of right. any of the brokerages. Yes, exactly. They're not getting paid a salary. Exactly. Here, most people are getting paid a salary, and they're just plodding through work. You got benefits. You got all of those. All things. of that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Just like golden handcuffs or silver handcuffs or bronze handcuffs. bronze yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah i mean i heard like the last time i was here Plastic. i met with someone who had just uh, i think it'd been at been at night oh <laughs> bleep <laughs> been at uh, one of the big corporates one of yeah. the big corporates uh, you can talk about the big corporates i wouldn't be i wouldn't be too concerned about it i mean they're also potential customers <laughs> no uh we'll see i guess uh, more so for the self-employed more so for the brokerage mm-hmm. market than anything else but anyways i met one of them and uh she was saying that the entry level salary was so horrible like i think it was like was it 20 or something like this 22 something like that yeah and that's not even like i don't know if there are other companies that are 15. wow yeah and there was something called a discretionary bonus that you get at the end of the year yeah i had that every year yeah Mm -hmm. and uh most people don't really get a great discretionary bonus and it's actually just like you know a namesake kind of thing that they do to avoid paying you a lot of money up front uh, but then at the end of the year, you're kind of left with, let's say you make 34, 35 kind of a thing. It's very hard to plan your yeah. life. Exactly. Very hard to plan your life and also live in the London of today. I yeah. feel like. Well, no, anywhere. Yeah. Like it, it doesn't really matter. You could be living in, in Delhi or Dubai. It doesn't really matter. Like not knowing what you're going to take home or not being a master of your own destiny yeah. is very, very tricky. Um, I also think it bleeds into, into like societal um, attitudes now where people are worried about their mental health. Yeah. Um, it is a genuine concern for people. Yeah. And insecurities can get the better of people. And if you don't know what you're gonna get at the end of the year, often it can be very painful, mm. especially for young people. Yeah. Um, and I just don't believe in discretionary bonuses. Yeah, no, that's totally fair. And you've obviously built this empire now, and it is- I don't know if it's an empire, but yeah. I think a lot of people think that, and uh, I think it is um, extremely significant kind of a thing in that sense. So how do you kind of prevent it from being, obviously you're the center of the show, you're the center of like, you know, so much else around the marketing of DDRE, et cetera. But at the same time, you have ownership for each person as their own businesses within DDRE, yeah. right? How do you kind of balance that attention on them versus you? And like, how do they feel like their own business, even though they're like obviously using your platform? Okay, let's let's tackle the piece about about the foundation of the business. Yeah. 
DDRE is the core characteristics of the founder-led yep. business, okay? So I believe in talking about your success, in attacking opportunity, in being driven, don't be shy to work hard, yep. enjoy the hard process, uh, um, do things and be meticulous about it, be considerate and thoughtful about your clients and your customers because they're gonna stay with you forever. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like a blueprint of my success and what I really believe. And that's what DDRE is, okay? What happens when you push out content and you're a founder of a business is that people get attracted to those characteristics and then they choose to they choose to adopt those characteristics even if they don't have them themselves. Mm. They'll either look to adopt them so it can form part of their armory and their arsenal so they can do well, yeah, or it just really resonate with their core fundamentals which are the ones that I've just listed. Yeah. And then what happens is people get attracted to it so you often don't, you don't attract people that that, that, that you're not attracting kind of thing, yes? Gotcha. Or aren't attracted to you, mm. to put it correctly. And that's the way founder-led businesses work. Mm. Do I like the founder? Do I respect the founder? Do I like the core ingredients of that business and why they're actually doing what they're doing? What is their goal? Or what is their North Star? And what are they trying to achieve? Because it's sometimes more than money. Mm. A lot of people that, that work in our business, for instance, Claudia, who's a superstar, she joined us at 19, she's 23, she's an integral part of our business. She's not getting paid hundreds of thousands of pounds, yep. but Claudia knows that she's moving the dial in an industry where the dial hasn't moved for decades. Yep. Claudia is making a difference every day. Mm. And she knows it, she can see it and she can feel it. And that is amazing. I never had that. No. That is amazing. And that's why our retention is incredible. When you start talking about agents and advisors and why they come here they come here because they fundamentally feel that this is the best place for them to succeed yep. okay and we give them the freedom to build their own brands in fact we incubate their talent to go after the top end of the market and enable them to deliver a service that we would be proud of yep. okay and that's what we try and do in our business you've got an avengers poster in your office yeah right and uh it's uh talking about exactly what you're saying effectively you know, you might have the founder piece, you might have the Tony Starks, right? That's awesome. But at the same time, if you don't have the rest of the Avengers, Tony Starks, got, like, I mean, like, it doesn't make a difference. Yeah. Right? So kind of like ha giving them that degree of empowerment and having them have their own personal brands and have sure. individuals resonate with that. Yeah. Such an important part of business that a lot of estate agencies and a lot of brokerages, even in Dubai, to be honest, they don't like promoting individual brands. They only want the core you know big brand name to be up there not daniel not claudia not joel not any like you know yeah i don't believe that yeah i don't think that's the best way to succeed yeah. and there are a number of reasons for it mm -hmm. um we have now essentially 40 people in our business that are all brand ambassadors no yeah. they have to understand how important it is and their roles are when they're speaking to the public mm -hmm. you know if you're walking down the street now marlebone high street and you're acting like an idiot, yeah, it's gonna harm your personal brand. Mm. You can do that over digital channels too. Yeah. Most people who are sensible, who wanna build a great career for themselves, they don't walk down the street in Marlborough High Street and look like an idiot, no. okay? They try and understand that, you know, in today's world, accountability is the most important thing yeah. and they have to be accountable for themselves. There's a saying, never outshine the boss. Mm. They are their own boss. To just outshining yourself, which is good always. So the way I look at it is oh. that I've been in businesses where my bosses thought that I was trying to outshine them, mm. okay? And that my shining yeah, is creating shadows that they appear in. Right. I never work that way. I always try to empower people around me, which is why I was enabled, why I'm able to bring in, I don't know, seven people from my previous business mm. that have all worked with me before. Yep. So they know what I'm like as a person, even though people would name me different things. But this shadow concept is an interesting one, because if one person is in, sh if one person is shining, other people are in shadows. But if everyone shines, no one's in the shadow. Mm. And that's the attitude that I want to take of my business moving forward. I want everyone to shine, yep. because that shining shines bright on other people too. Yeah, I think that's why everyone here is so, I mean, at least within the agents, I feel like it's quite collaborative. Like the culture seems to be that, at least from surface. Yeah, I think that yeah. we've been taught terrible ethics in business mm. over the years. I think the generation ahead of us 
have been a bit greedy in terms of attitude. Okay, there was opportunity and they went after it and that's fine. But I'd rather make this much on a lot of deals than a huge amount on one deal. Yep. And if you look at the psyche around stuff like that, in today's world, young people really struggle with the ups and downs of commission-based companies and roles. Yep. So why not put yourself in a position where you don't have to rely on a singular transaction to, to pay off your whole year, yeah, in rent mm. or whatever it may be, mortgage. Why not take little chunks from other people because they're all collaborating with one another? Mm. And how does that, how does that compound? Yep. And they're all posting about one another and championing one another and it just becomes, it just spirals, it just grows and grows and grows. Yep. And I think that that is the, well, my view is that that's how we've grown. Now let's pause on that thought for a second. The yep. little bits from a large volume of deals versus just having one big deal. You've got a second company that we don't talk about a lot in the context of, I mean, like, uh, say we the media <laughs> um, but the media doesn't really have sufficient um, you know understanding of this and I'm sure they will when you're when you want to put it out there but you've got a company called advisor yeah advisor is the technology arm and you've always said that DDRE is a technology media company selling media marketing company yeah. oh, sorry <laughs> no, that was right. it's okay. media marketing company um, selling real estate hold on, hold on. technology media marketing <clears throat> okay Technology, media, marketing, Very good. <laughs> company selling real estate, right? Yeah. Um, well, it sells a service. Right. But advisor, obviously, is something to supercharge all of these things, right? Yeah. I just had um, Sarah and Elliot on the podcast earlier, yeah. and we were talking about this in, at length. Why did you, most people in your shoes would not start a technology company because you're so good at what you do already in the context yeah. of real estate. Yeah, Sarah said I was crazy in the beginning. Yeah, so why, why do it at all, right? Like, why did you feel the need to kind of get your hands dirty in the technology landscape as well? I, I see opportunity there. Yeah. <laughs> it's super simple. Yeah. Um, I see opportunity. I think businesses are now not on earth, they're in the cloud. Yeah. And if they're in the cloud, they're hypermobile. And it means that you've got great opportunity because there's not many companies that are being built in the cloud. Right. Um, can I afford to have a thousand offices around the world? No. Can I afford to have a thousand people on a platform working in collaboration? Yes. What's your vision for ADBSR? Well, let me let me just explain That's... before we go into well, ADBSR. Yeah. Is this? I mean, you you describe ADBSR. Oh fuck! <laughs> <laughs> this again. Um, okay, I think advisor is a way for you as an agent in one country to sell real estate internationally regardless of whether you're represented there or not because the real estate business is a trust business and um, one where if you have a trusted ally in another country you can sell real estate through them because you've got buyers who want to buy internationally and that's yeah. what's changed people are not just looking to buy a house next to the school of their children they're also looking to buy a holiday home in Mabea or like in Dubai or whatever it might be and the reality is you can only be in one place at one time but advisor effectively helps you be in multiple places that's my description of it okay let's let's do like for practical terms mm. you've got an office in a big firm yeah and they have seven different columns of uh, of income yeah. okay you've got residential commercial international and whatever else mm. okay you don't need a physical office to create relationships with people anymore you just need a technological platform that enables you to work in collaboration with other people around the world that's it. Right. So this is a white labeling service tool mm. that enables you to syndicate your properties that you're mandated on to other people around the world. So you get more exposure yep. and you work in collaboration with other people around the world because my buyers are either coming from overseas or other parts of London. Mm. And I want to make sure my client's properties are in front of those people. How they're going to do that. I'm going to do it by a trusted source, which is an agent that is already communicating with them. Yep. It's super simple. Like that's how I built my career. Mm. I built my career doing exactly that. Everyone else wanted to play the narrow game, which is I want to do as much as I can. Mm. And I was like, no, I'm prepared to share with everybody. Really simple. Yeah. And I'll, I'll put it into perspective, actually, because other people might learn something interesting. They may even be doing it themselves. When Uber came to the UK, I wasn't earning a huge amount of money at the time. But I like to invest in myself and what I do for a living. And... I took the expensive Ubers, they were called Uber Black. I think they're still called Uber Execs, Black. No. Right, or Exec, yeah. right? But I think at the time they were called Uber Black. Mm. 
And I took multiple Uber Blacks when they first got here. And I used to say to the drivers, hey, um, just out of interest, do you get people, wealthy people, sit in the back of your car? So I'd be like, yeah. So like, okay, cool. Do they ever talk about real estate? Yeah, they do. I said, here's my business card. I'm the number one guy in London at what I do. If you ever get anybody who expresses an interest in buying or selling or leasing any real estate, give me a call and I'll look after you. Wild. Okay. So and the, you've now you've the driver, the driver yeah. Yeah. was very close to the customer. Mm. They were in a captive audience essentially. They were in that car. They weren't going anywhere, and he would be able to say, "Here's his card. Give him a call now." Oh, wild. Right. Yeah. They're not jumping out on the A40. That's mm. not happening. So I would use everybody as a conduit. All my customers, all my clients, past and present, people I know. I'd have a good positive brand, personal brand, where I dressed nicely, I was respectful, manners are really important, and I made sure, because I knew as a young man who had nothing, yep. that my brand, as to how people feel about me, is very important for me to succeed. Yep. So I made sure that I had a group of people that wanting, wanted me to succeed, because I was humble and kind and generous and charming and well-mannered and thoughtful and considered like all the attributes that your mum wants you to have yeah right i try to impress mm. and so i used use is probably a wrong term so i made sure that i but people around me knew that i would appreciate introductions mm. and i became more successful because every time they thought real estate they thought you correct yeah and i did it in person and i did it digitally mm. so much so that i called myself the market yeah and uh, about that right like uh, obviously you jumped on the social media train a lot earlier than pretty much anybody else yeah and then you got a lot of heat for it as well yeah great yeah and how do you kind of you know now if you were to let's say there's a ddre agent starting tomorrow what would you what would you tell them how do you you know so i went through an interesting phase in my life yeah which i think a lot of young people who are driven go through too mm. um which is that um you get a lot of naysayers around you yeah that take the piss out of you joke with you bully you whatever it may be mm-hmm. uh in a personal environment or professional environment and your job is to recognize the opportunity and not listen to the bullshitters mm. that's your job right do not pay attention to people who have a negative response to something that you're trying to achieve if you're doing it for the right reason yep then have a core group of people around you to help support you or pull you back down every now and again when you're getting a bit too high on your supply. Yeah. I have a couple of those people. <laughs> My dad, yeah, pushes me up. My mum calls me down. <laughs> My best friend yep. got a lot of grief when I started doing the social media thing 10 years ago. Yeah. because no one would say it to my face. We weren't best friends 10 years ago. I don't I don't, I don't I... besties. <laughs> Go on. My best friend got a lot of grief. Yeah. He was on the end of a lot of grief. He had to fight my battles with me not in the room because people wouldn't talk they wouldn't talk ill about me to my face. Mm-hmm. So what I find very interesting especially for the young people out there is like don't care too much about opinions from people who you are in competition with. Mm. Or opinions of people who aren't striving for the success you're looking for. Yeah, that's the two things that I would think about. And for you to succeed, you need to go through pain. It's often the first signal of success that you're going through that. Yeah. And so so I did that for maybe I think I went through a bit of pain for about 7 years. Mm. And then here you are. Yeah, but then I go and do a TV show. Yeah. And everyone thinks I'm loopy. The second overnight success. Well, yeah, second overnight success. Um but I, but as I find now it's quite interesting for people that are listening to this because When you don't go to university and you don't study anything, you don't come out of MIT or Cambridge or whatever it is, people have a very low level of expectation of you, right? <laughs> so when you go to try and achieve something, there'll be a lot of naysayers because you haven't achieved anything before. Yep. So they just think you're not capable of doing anything better. This is the opposite. Especially especially if you you um you're doing something different. Mm. Right? Okay, so so that happens at the early age. If you're young, that's what's going to happen. When you do achieve something where you really put your neck on the line and it works out because the social media thing is an obvious thing now for many people. Yep. Yeah. When I go and do TV or Netflix, less people question why I would do it. Mm. Because now I've set a a form of uh um 
reputation where Daniel does things that aren't easy, right? And can often feel a little bit away with the fairies. Mm -hmm. But then they often do come off. So now people won't necessarily go against what we're doing. And if they do, they'll do it quietly. There'll be less naysayers. Yep. Because they don't want to be the person who's the naysayer yep. when it came to social media and then was proven wrong, right? And now have to produce content over digital channels and I get to see it. Mm. They don't want to be that person. I definitely don't want to be that person. I don't want to pull anyone down mm. or put shadow on people. I don't want to do that. You want to shine. I want them to shine. There we go. 100%. Yep. I want them to shine. So that's what's really fascinating because mm. if I had left Cambridge yep. and I don't learn the way you would learn at school, at university, even though ironically I'm a guest lecturer at university now about entrepreneurialism and really? real estate. Yeah, oh, that's new. I didn't know that one. I can't even spell. <laughs> Wonderful, isn't it? Anyway, so that's that's now. If I had gone to Cambridge or Oxford or Manchester Uni, mm. I don't think I would have got as many questions. Mm. I really don't. I think people who just backed me. It just took me 25 years to or 20 years to prove to everybody that actually, you know, sometimes when I go against the grain. There's a, there's a good reason for it. Wow. Well, yeah. I, I think that's something to take away for sure um, for all of those aspiring sort of agents. And well, you're one of those folks. people. Aspiring agent? No, I'm not an aspiring <laughs> agent. But I've you. had a lot of offers, I have to say. <laughs> you, you have no idea. You were like, if your company ever fails, just give us a call. <laughs> <laughs> They'll take so, anyone in Dubai now. Yeah, hey, no, 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 yeah, yeah kidding, like, kidding. company I'm fail. Kidding. Yeah, I'm that's kidding. Yellow. I'm kidding. <laughs> no. But, um, you know, talking about DDR, let's uh, spice things up a little bit. Where are you going with this? You're all, oh, <laughs> you, you don't want to. This is the question I was telling you about earlier that oh, okay. um, Elliot was telling me to ask. Um, if you were to sell a home, who would you ask? Here in this business? Agent? Yeah. Depends on which neighborhood. Oh, come on. Yeah, boy. <laughs> to be fair. Can't corner me, you know dude. What, you know what he said what? Uh, would be your answer? He said that you'd say that your home is too expensive. Oh, to uh, really? <laughs> No, no, no. So, yeah. um, well, firstly, I wouldn't represent myself. Yeah. I definitely wouldn't represent myself. I think that's really dangerous. Yeah. Um, because emotion gets in the way. Mm -hmm. It depends on it depends where on London and also the asset size. Yeah. So, like, I think Remy's really talented, but I'm not sure I would give my hundred million pound property to Remy because I don't think she's ready for that, right? Yeah. And she'd be honest with you and say that. Yeah. Um, I think the person with most experience to sell very expensive homes is Jess. No. That's just a fact. Yeah. Um, but uh, but Benji in the business knows Little Venice better than everyone else, so probably Benji. Mm. That would make sense. That's when everyone can deliver us. This is the thing that we talk about, right? Is there's more information available to the agent than ever before. Yeah. In fact, there's more information available to customers and clients than ever before. Yeah. In fact, you can get a valuation of your property online within 30 seconds. Yeah. So the value of valuing property yeah. is getting smaller. Unless you know something that other people don't know. Mm. Like trends in buyer pools and a new school coming along and there'll be more people coming to that school or a train line or there's an underground nearby or you know all these nuances so now having a niche mm. becomes really important and valuable now I don't necessarily have a niche because I call myself a segment of the market yep. which is very unusual yeah so I've said well if you have 10 million or 20 million or 30 or 50 or 100 million pounds to spend I'm a good person to advise you that's what I said. That was my choice. Yeah. But I do know certain neighborhoods more intimately than others. That's right. Right? Yeah. So it's my job to work in collaboration with other people who know more information than I do. What is that conversation like when you're selling a, let's say, a $400 million home, right? And you've got this, how does it work? Like, how do they come in a helicopter and then they just like, yeah, yes. Or is it... Do they care about the bathrooms at that profile, point? Or profile, profile. Yeah, I think the question I get, a lot of people go, why is, there not, why is there always one more bathroom than there is bedrooms? Oh, really? Like, who needs a bathroom <laughs> if you don't have a bedroom? Which, I, which, which is quite funny and probably quite true. Yeah. Um, we're not precise enough with our attitudes to why people make decisions. So, I remember mm. when I was selling homes to people who were financers. A lot of bankers. Yeah. 
if they got paid a good bonus and it was the right time of the year, they'd probably be a little bit freer with their cash yep. and probably pay a little bit more of a premium. Mm. Would they be in the numbers? Yeah, they'd look at the numbers. Whether or not the interest rate is high or low, is a good investment, so on and so on, they'll be looking at it like a bank would look at it. If you deal with creatives, it's much more about emotion, whether or not the first five second goes really well. Mm. Yeah, How they approach the home, what time of day, you know, all that sort of stuff becomes really important, yeah. even more important because they're making a decision like that. Mm. Nowadays, and I posted about this on, on Instagram, a lot of buyers are tech bros mm. and gals. Not yet, but yeah. Why not? <laughs> and, and you guys yeah. uh, think very differently to those people. You're, you're really in the numbers and you will look at data and analytics. And it's funny because I'm helping someone at the moment um, who's very, very successful. And I know the kind of person I'm doing business with. So when we are looking at properties, I don't just send him nice pictures in a video. I'm analyzing the data that gives him a proof point as to what decision he should think about making. And that data is a shed ton of data. Mm. And it's done in charts through Excel and you can type numbers in that kick off different rates and so on and so on. And I'm doing that because I know that he's going to feel comfortable making a decision because of the information I'm delivering to him in the way that he wants to receive it. Yep. Often people don't work that way. Mm. So there's that. And he liked it so much that he sent me a GIF going, <laughs> right? That's funny, that's funny. Because, yeah. because business is more fun nowadays. Yeah. There's a lot riding on it, but people casual. are less stiff. Yeah. They're more casual. These are, these are things that are changing in our world and probably other industries all the time. Mm. I'm in groups now, technology groups, mm. with some of the most affluent big tech, the tech people on the planet. Yep. And they're sharing articles from different places and it's all rather interesting. Yep. That would never have happened before. It's, uh, it's so interesting. Like whenever I've been, you know, me and my networking grind, um, yeah. it's always the teach me something I don't know kind of piece that keeps a relationship, makes it a relationship rather than a fan encounter almost, mm. right? I've had all these brokerage heads come on the podcast, right? And um, usually they come in there after me just pestering them like mm -hmm. crazy, like, oh, please come, like, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, once they're there, they're listening. And when they're listening, they're saying, what is this kid telling us that we don't already know? Yeah. And if there is something that you are saying that they don't already know, which usually turns out to be the case because I come from a different world and they come from a different one, yeah. they're willing to listen. And I think um, with a lot of, instead of, like you said, just shilling and like, you know, sending pictures and images and videos or whatever it is um, and telling them, hey, here's what I'm selling. It's what are you in the market for kind of a thing and then oh here's why i think that this might be an, a more interesting idea and then honing down on, okay cool like this is a transaction layer which is usually the last thing on their mind like oh where's the where do i enter my card details i mean i'm sure that's not how it works but like you know you know that would saying. be sick if it, if i it, know it, if it were that way it'd be it'd be much easier no i know i know it's a maybe maybe one day right yeah, i will we'll get there yeah so um Talk to me about how you're thinking about AI, right? Um, that is the elephant in the room that most real estate brokerages shove under the carpet, don't want to talk about it. Oh, I've used ChatGPT once. Um, what are you thinking? Uh, like, what's kind of your view on all of this? It's more of a statement. Mm. AI is going to take the job of the organization that KPIs their staff to losing their job. Mm. Because if you can KPI people's behavior, AI can do it much more efficiently. Mm. And that's what I find really interesting. So if our back office here is more efficient, which it is, our EAs here, um, and a couple of the guys uh, uh, and gals have got EAs because their business is growing and their EAs are now not, not just performing um, sorts of medial tasks like your emails and calendar invites and stuff like that but they're also creating content mm. so the EA's role changes first yep. which I find really interesting we saw that coming how is AI going to 
uh, impact our industry, it's going to make people like me really efficient, mm. even more efficient than I already am. And if I'm more efficient, I'm going to cover more ground. If I'm covering more ground and I'm meeting more people, I'll be doing more business. And if I'm doing more business, there's someone else out there who's losing the business. So I find that really interesting. I think young people in the industry need to build their digital footprint and hurry the F up. Mm. Um, because speaking to groups of people about what you do is very valuable. Yeah. And, it, and it ensures your relevance in a world that will be filled with, with information and AI. Yeah. He or she that can deliver that information efficiently or to a group of people that anyone else can uh, deliver information to won't be that valuable. But he or she that can deliver information to other people where other people can't deliver information to them become really valuable. Mm. And then the AI pushes the HI to get better. <laughs> the what? <laughs> HI, human intelligence. Oh, okay, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, you know, so like human intelligence yeah. being... The, the strongest impact AI has forces HI to mm. be better. And HI is social skills. Yeah. Because that's what we will all have. Mm. And they will be more valuable. Yeah. How I say hello to you, how I make you feel when you say hello. Do you smile when you see me? Do mm. I give you a hug? Do I fist pump you? Do I shake your hand? I've got a billionaire client of mine who doesn't shake hands. Mm. The fact that I know that I need to fist pump him puts me ahead of all the other agents. People don't think about stuff like that, but communication is the most important thing. Mm. And that is a form of communication. So I'm intrigued to where it's gonna go. I mean, we've had conversations for hours about where it's gonna go. I think that the businesses that run factories to KPI their people are doing their people a disservice. Mm. And their people I, I fear for with their roles moving forward. Um, the businesses that have an eye on the future yep. will think about becoming enabler for the people that deliver a service. Mm. Mm, that's where I think it's going. Or no, it's going. Wow. Uh, well, I'm glad you didn't say something. There's this meme of, uh, I won't say, global political figure yep. who said that AI is uh, Asian intelligence. Uh, <laughs> 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 which is very different. But Could be Asian you know. intelligence. Oh, oh, like that. oh, oh, that's going into the... No, man, I've trademarked that shit. <laughs> Leah, trademark, <laughs> trademark AI, Asian um, intelligence. I love that. You know, I, uh, I love your team out here. You know, when you mentioned Leah and like everyone else, like, they're so friendly, everyone's so nice, and like also they're killers, like you know, at the same time. So, <laughs> so I tell, yeah. uh, you need to create that environment as a business, as a business owner and leader. Yeah. And we started that when we had three or four people. Yeah. And it, and the reason why we did that, or what we did, was that anyone who came to visit us in our office, we would never, ever, ever just sit at our desks mm. and smile and wave or just keep looking at our computer. We all get up to say hello. Mm. And that builds a foundation of being kind to people when they visit the office and it creates an emotional reaction and people are up for it and they like it and they love it. Yeah. We never want anyone to walk into our office and feel unloved. Yeah, I mean, I think the first time I came in here, um, like- Be Jess careful was, what you say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The first time I came in here, I think it was um, Jess that came up and was like, hey, I've got this like, you know, this thing with this tech problem. And I was just like, what? you don't even know me, right? And the fact that you feel comfortable to do that is great because now I feel comfortable talking to well, you. Well, you're a friend of the brand. Well, when you're, you. when you're a friend, yeah. no, I'm serious. When you're a friend of the brand, yeah. the brand is a friend of yours. Yeah. And that's how it works. Yeah. So will there be a season two of Buying London? <laughs> great question. We don't know yet. We'll soon find out. You know, um, a little birdie on the street a few, few. <laughs> yeah god i feel like i messed up the double meaning of that <laughs> in the uk it probably means something else but anyways um apparently there is going to be one that's what the town is saying at least um you're not gonna you're not gonna spill the tea on that right? which no you know. because i have no confirmation of it actually happening yeah um i think the world wants it yeah we were we were top 10 in 55 different countries so we know that we know that there's a format for it and they like it um, let's see what happens. I'm just pleased I did it. Yeah. You know, you'll, you'll find times in your life where you could be risk on or risk off. Yeah. I've often gone with my gut instinct. 
<laughs> and uh, it's paid off. What's next for Daniel Daggers? I mean, we're going to grow our business. We're going to grow the ADVSR platform. I want to have a massive impact on the industry. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why, but why not? Mm -hmm. And I'm at a point in my life where experience now meets opportunity. And yep. I'm not going to let effort get in the way. So that's my attitude. And I just need a group of people that are willing to come on the journey with me. And uh, I think I've got those people and we're going to grow. In a world of insane change, having somebody leading your business with a very strong vision is mm. really important. Because everyone here is getting in the bus every morning when they come to work into the coach mm. and I'm the coach driver. And this is how I explain it to people in the business. Every day, because we work at the top end of the market, we're at the, we're at the top of this mountain. Yeah. And the day starts at 8.30, 9 o'clock, whatever it may be. And everyone gets in the, the school van, mm. right? The school bus. And we have a journey during the course of the day, which is dangerous. It's at the top of a mountain and you have this undulating road mm. and you're going round and so on and so on. And most businesses have been doing it for years. And the road never changes. Yeah. It's the same road. And it has been the same road for 20 years. And whilst you're on the side of the cliff, essentially, out on a mountain, you know the journey. And actually, you can do it with your eyes shut. Mm. And at the end of the journey, everyone gets out and they go home. In today's world, that journey is not the same. It's raining now. It's hailstorms. It's thunder and lightning. And there's boulders on the road. And you need a new journey. And you have to ask yourself, whether or not the coach driver can navigate the new journey, which is quite treacherous. So there are people in our business that I feel very, very, very proud of that they trust me to drive that bus for them. Because people here don't have to work here to be successful. They choose to work here because they believe in the vision. And that is why we're successful. You know, I, I never get tired of the you've got a lot of these to be fair like the the roads are one i've heard other like you know like pretty cool riddles and all this fun stuff you always throw one at me whenever we meet but you get it right yeah i do and I you do. see it yeah i get it and it's like you're also training them to be drivers in the future 100 anyway, percent, right because they're going to need to lead other people yeah. and god forbid something happens to me we need more drivers yeah let's let's not yeah let's get into that part right <laughs> We'll just uh, do a few fewer Ranush nights. It'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be all right. Um, okay. My final question to you. Mm. And I ask this to all of my guests. Is, oh, okay. uh, what advice would you give your 21-year-old self? Self-awareness. Confidence. Hard work. Determination. Kindness. Personal brand. Are all foundations of success. I will plow my kid with confidence, but I'll make sure that they're self-aware at the same time. This world will slap you very quickly, very, very quickly, the world that we live in, if you're not strong enough. Mm. Because everyone knows when you fail. And you have to be able to take that on the chin and keep going. So you need those core attributes. Awesome. Well probably my most interesting episode of the real ones to date i um, love the i love the real ones though yeah i love it <laughs> um so daniel <laughs> yeah what's he's the... just giving you the question <laughs> thank you lax you, you have you to say, the man. yeah yeah you lax, have to say that of course you. of course yeah. i said thank you lax credit um, where credit's due so we were we were we were recording and we were just wrapping up this is going to cut it at some point <laughs> um and lax who's been very kind enough to film all of this has just asked a very interesting question Daniel, mm. what was the <laughs> lowest point in your life and how do you come out of it? There's many low points. Mm -hmm. There's many. Um, I went through a stage in my life where a couple of things, like I sold the most expensive home that, um, that I've ever sold at the time for over $100 million. And that was the saddest moment of my life because I had no one to share it with. I didn't believe that the business I was working in cared. 
Mm. I didn't get paid a lot for it. Uh, there wasn't a moment of enjoyment. And if you can't enjoy something and share it with your colleagues or the people that you love, or, you know, because my parents live abroad, that was really difficult. That was very sad. Mm. It was like, you know, you don't know how it feels. You sort of, you sort of think you know what it might feel like, and you know, you'll be, ex you'll be exuberant, and you know, it's crazy, but it isn't. Doesn't work that way. So having something amazing to share with someone else or group of people is wonderful. Mm. So that's why working in a team is really important. Or group of people, not going just independent by yourself. Yeah. Lone wolf, you can't share your successes. That's one thing. The other thing is like, um, I left my previous business yeah. um, and I was outed in the press and they called me every name under the sun, which I don't think is a fair reflection of me. Uh, you know, loud, untrustworthy, uh, uh, braggy, all this sort of stuff. I just, you know, it didn't, I didn't feel that was right and it shook me a bit. You start wondering if that's true in your own echo chamber. And I'm mentally resilient, mm. like really resilient. So that, that was something where I needed to ground myself yep. with that. So it took a little bit of time when seeing my mum and dad, my mum's a tough cookie and she said, fuck them. <laughs> my mum was, my mum, yeah, hundred percent. My mum, yeah. my mum at the time was 80, 80 years old. Mm. And my mum said, People are going to tell stories about you your whole life, but they're just stories. It's not you. And anyone who knows you knows what you're really like. So don't care about any stories that people say about you because they're utterly irrelevant. Mm. And then she used loads of F-bombs and <laughs> maybe even a C word. Um, <laughs> that was tough. That was really tough. Highs. I don't really remember the highs. No. I think that when you're, um, and there's probably a lot of people like this, when you're really determined and focused and you have a vision, mm. there's no ending to your vision. Your vision doesn't stop. Da da! Like Super Mario Kart mm. at the end of the course. It doesn't work that way. So it's rare that you're celebrating your success in the moment of achieving something because your vision's still there. Mm. And highly successful people have a vision that just continues. And often when that vision stops or that drive stops, they stop. And that's why you'll find that there's a lot of people that continue working until their 80s and 90s and 100, whatever it may be, because they're built for it. No. I've had lots of successful moments in my career and selling 70 million pounds worth of property whilst I was away in Cannes and I had a moment by myself with my headphones in that I recorded and I was walking down the Croisette and I did two big deals, one in Mayfair for 38 million and one in Notting Hill for 36 million. So whatever that is combined, 75 million, 76 million, whatever it may be. And I thought to myself, wow, this local authority kid who, doesn't, who didn't have a great education, didn't succeed at school, failed at football, couldn't talk to girls for 20 years or whatever it may be. Um, I'm pretty good. Like, this isn't a fluke. Yeah. I'm doing this on the regular. Mm -hmm. I must be quite good at this. <laughs> and then when you look at success, I'm very comfortable in my skin now. Yeah. When I go meet a client, I never feel intimidated. It doesn't matter if you're a royal family member and I have to greet you with your highness yep. or billionaire tech entrepreneur or, or, or someone, my friend who's looking to, Sarah's looking to buy an apartment. <laughs> like it's all the same thing. Yep. Uh, and I love it. I love helping people and I really like that sort of stuff. So vision's kind of a curse as well. Probably, but I'd rather take that curse than no vision at all. Yeah, I think on the same board um, on that end. Yeah. Um, Wow. Need to get in the gym more though. Ah, you and me both. And play football. <laughs> you haven't even started, dude. Are you serious? <laughs> Should we go to Barry's tomorrow? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> so that's been this week's episode of The Real Ones. Come back next week for yet another one. Daniel Daggers, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, brother. <laughs> oh, no, we have to do it again. Ready? Thank you, brother. Oh. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Amazing.